this is the, uh, uh, the main item on the image of the front cover of the book. Um, I think the front cover is terrific, by the way, and I'm very grateful to the publishers for it. The only criticism I've heard is that the authorial photo on the front hasn't been updated to reflect the six years of ravages that have been exacted on the author himself. Um, this cartoon from the New Yorker showing what they describe as 700,000 years of progress sort of encapsulates what the book is about, but uh, it's a reminder also of the dangers of making factual errors when you get involved in this kind of work. This uh, time scale is at least an order of magnitude wrong when it comes to describing the length of time that separates us from our common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos. And of course that means there's been a very large amount of time for our brains to develop away from the brains of the other social primates. Nevertheless, the key message of the book is that we're social primates and that we behave as social primates even in uh, the kinds of environment that other social primates are not used to, such as Wall Street and uh, the City of London. I'd like to start actually by getting you to talk a bit. Um, somebody tell me what you think is happening in this picture. Don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Give me a quick answer. It's a market. So an economist has come to talk to you and you've got it right. It's a market. <laughs> now, who's buying and who's selling in this market? The child is selling. The child is selling. Yes. And who's buying? The, the women are buying. Okay. How do you know? They're checking what... They're just looking at something in her hand. They're checking the quality of something. She's got some money. Possibly. Yeah, money. She's got money in her hand. Yes. Any other suggestions as to how you know who's buying and who's selling? Right, okay, so the women are looking at the merchandise. There's also the expression on her face. I think she thinks it's too much money. Right, okay. <laughs> but who came up with the idea that the boy is selling? Me. Right, and why? Right, good. Now, let me just draw your attention to what an astonishing piece of induction you've just performed. First of all, instantly, I mean, I don't know the answer any more than you do. I got this picture off the web, but the... <laughs> Paul, 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 can I just stop you for one second? It, there's a lot of seats. If you're sitting at the back, it's uncomfortable. Come and sit in the, in the seats. Sorry, Paul, just for one minute. But I think you're right. And the remarkable thing is how counterintuitive your conclusion was. Because, you know, we live in countries where children, by and large, by law, are not allowed to sell things. It's very unusual to see children selling things. Even in Africa, the proportion of people selling things in a market who are children is very small. Okay, yet you instantly jumped to what I think is the correct conclusion, that the child is selling. And you did so because you saw something about the position of his eyes and you compared it with the position of the eyes of the other people. Now, you know, whether you're right or wrong about that is not the point. What I'd like to draw everybody's attention to is what an astonishing piece of deduction you performed and very fast and before you were able to explain how you've done it. And that, in a sense, encapsulates a theme that is common to the book and is going to be a part of the talk, which is that our brains have some astonishingly sophisticated inferential mechanisms which are able to size up social relationships and to interpret them in terms of economic relationships. And they're so sophisticated that they work at a pre-conscious level before we can even explain why we do what we do. And that's just a small example of the kinds of capacities that our social primate brains have evolved to help us to navigate a world in which we do something that no other primate does, which is to conduct very sophisticated exchanges, relying on the trustworthiness of our partners with people who are not only completely unrelated to us, but whom, in most cases, we've never even met. So, let me do what um, people from software companies like Microsoft regularly have to do, which is to explain to an install base of customers why they should pay for the upgrade. Okay? Um, the Company of Strangers, as Matthew kindly said, was published in 2004, and apart from a few people who missed it uh, at the time, um, there are obviously some people who read the original one, and its central message, uh, which remains as true today as it was, is that our modern world is built to an extent that is so extraordinary that we often overlook it ourselves on exchanges between complete strangers. So if you think what happens when you leave your house in the morning to go to work, you know, you may stop and buy a newspaper, put together by an extraordinary team of people who have thoughtfully made it available for you to buy. You may buy a cup of coffee. Some 
farmer, perhaps in Central America, planted those beans quite a long time ago. Uh, somebody harvested them, then sent them to the other side of the world where they've been ground and roasted and made available for you all by people who had no idea that you would be stopping by this morning to buy that cup of coffee. And you then perhaps get on a bus or on a train, and again, an entire network of people are collaborating just to get you to your destination. And that web of collaborative activity is so extraordinary that most of us completely overlook it. We just go through the motions every day without thinking what web of collaboration our lives depends on. And you hear occasionally people saying, you know, the modern world is a, a purely competitive world. But if you actually break it down in terms of the number of people you meet as you go about your day-to-day -day work, a far greater number of those are your collaborators than are your sworn competitors. Now, as the book in 2004 said, we navigate that world nevertheless with Stone Age brains. And our Stone Age brains evolved in a world in which we had suspicion and hostility of strangers, mostly for the very good reason, as I'll describe in a moment, that strangers were lethal to us. And so what I want to know is how we did it. How were our Stone Age brains able to navigate a modern world that was quite unlike the social world of our prehistoric ancestors? And Although the book is in some ways a very optimistic book because it says, look at the amazing things we've done, it also drew attention to the dangers that lurked in our Paleolithic psychology. Now, in 2004, nobody really wanted to know about the fragility of the world economy, but um, fortunately for me and very unfortunately for most of the other participants in the world economy, the financial crisis that exploded in, or well, began in 2007 and really hit the fan as it were in 2008, um, made the fragility of our interlinked world economy more evident than it had ever been before. And The Economist magazine was uh, kind enough to, to vote a page to the book saying, if you missed it in 2004, this is what you should uh, know to uh, understand what's going on today. So my publishers called me up and said, help, do you know how to understand what's uh, going on today? Uh, your book says you do. And I said, uh, no, but give me time and I'll work on it. And the result is the new edition of 2010. And in particular, what that edition does is to uh, cover the very impressive amount of research that is going on virtually as we speak on our Stone Age brains and how they work. Um, you might say, well, you know, a book that covers the last 10,000 years of human history surely should be able to wait a 1,000 years or so for the second edition. But in fact, you would be astonished to see how much uh, research is going on and how fast the advances are in understanding the limitations of our reasoning and how those relate to what natural selection has uh, chosen as the model for our, our minds. And then the book spends quite a lot of time talking about how the limitations of our Stone Age brains can explain the financial crisis. Okay, so what I want to do today, and I may have to be rather quick over some parts of this, is first of all to underline the predicament of modern societies, the fact that it depends on trust between strangers. Then I want to look in particular at the role that trust plays in complex systems of risk management like banking systems. Then I want to take a step back in in history and in fact into prehistory and to try and give a sense of historical perspective about how human societies have managed risk. How does risk today compare with risk in the distant past? Then I want to talk a little bit about what we know now about how we did it. What was it about our Stone Age minds that were able to shift from a social world that was quite small and limited to a social world that is now absolutely vast. And then I want to say, how do we use those insights to try and understand modern crises of trust? And I want to compare the banking crisis of the 1930s and those of uh, the last couple of years in order to see if we can get some insights from that. Okay, well, I've already underlined the fact that in modern societies, even the very simplest elements of our daily lives, you know, forget about you know, massive technological feats of cooperation, but just simple things like a cup of coffee or a shirt depend upon the collaboration of others, most of whom we're never going to see. And it requires trust for two uh, important reasons. One sort of obvious reason, which is that many of the elements of an exchange in a modern economy are not simultaneous. So, you know, uh, I uh, write a book and uh, hopefully sell a book, and uh, the people who pay it don't pay directly with the food that I need to eat. Uh, what happens is they pay with money, and money is a claim, a socially recognized claim, which can then be used for uh, various other things that I, I might need. But there's a more sophisticated or more subtle reason why 
trust is required, which is that the value of what we exchange often isn't transparent. Most of the things that you buy and most of the things that you sell are not ones whose value is immediately transparent to the person buying them. And that's very important. That means you have to take on trust the quality of the work that the person has undertaken in making that available for you. So how do we know who to trust in a world in which all of these people that we trust are, in most cases, invisible to us? Well, the difficult part of that is that our psychology of trust, which is very sophisticated, evolved for face-to-face -face transactions, like that picture I showed you. Okay? We can size up people that we, that we see. But most of these people we never see. So what do we do? The solution, as the book describes in great detail, is trust in institutions. But the story I want to tell you is not one of trust in institutions edging out face-to-face -face psychology. It's trust in institutions depending on and building on face-to-face -face psychology. And that's essentially going to be the outline of the story that I'll give you in a moment. Now, let me see how that applies to complex systems of risk management, like banking systems. Um, if somebody gives you a check for 50 pounds, you don't normally have to ask yourself a question about whether it's worth the same as a check for 50 pounds from somebody else's bank. And that's you know, remarkable, because banks' investments, as, and don't we know it, are inherently risky. Um, but when you get a check, you're not having to ask yourself complicated questions about, is your 50 pounds as worth as much as somebody else's 50 pounds? And that happens because banks basically pool their risk so as to reduce the aggregate risk, but because there's a lot of risk left, they then distribute it out again so that most of us, the depositors in the banks, just simply don't have to ask ourselves questions about whether the check is, is, is worth it. And the American financial economist Gary Gorton has described in, uh, I think, a very effective metaphor why it is that financial systems work so well when they work well. He says, a banking system allows somebody who knows nothing about finance to use finance effectively, just as an electricity grid allows somebody to use electricity without being an electrician, without knowing anything about the physics of electricity. And that, in a sense, leads us on to explain why it is that financial systems, like sometimes electricity grids, can be very vulnerable. They're very vulnerable because the enormous majority of people using them are not asking questions about their stability. It's the very success of the system, in meaning that most people don't have to ask questions about their riskiness, that makes them particularly vulnerable to the laziness or the incompetence of the occasional people who are supposed to be asking the questions and who aren't. And the metaphor, I think, for that is the metaphor of the autopilot. One of the big dangers of modern flying is that the autopilots are so effective that um, the real pilots have great difficulty staying alert and awake for the very rare moments when the autopilot fails. And in some sense, the story of our banking systems is not just a story of greed and incompetence and, uh, uh, and dishonesty, because greed and incompetence and dishonesty are with us all the time, just as gravity is there all the time and is not what explains a plane crash, even though you wouldn't have a plane crash without gravity. The, just as you need something else to explain why the plane crashed when it did, why did the autopilot fail, we need a story to explain why the financial system crashed when it did. Now, let me take the, the step back historically and try to give you a sense of um, how far we've come. Here is one of the iconic pictures of recent years. Many of you will recognize this. This is from the closed circuit uh, TV at Columbine High School and it shows the two gunmen uh, in the process of killing uh, a large number of children. This is um, a press photograph taken in Blacksburg, Virginia, when uh, a gunman also went uh, and uh, shot a, a large number of students. Many people thinking about these pictures would concur with the idea that the modern world is a uniquely dangerous place. So let me give you a couple of uh, uh, sentiments to this effect. The 49th World Health Assembly in 1996 noted, quote, with great concern, the dramatic worldwide increase in the incidence of intentional injuries affecting people of all ages and both sexes, but especially women and children. Nelson Mandela, no less a mor moral authority than that, said the 20th century will be remembered as a century marked by violence. Now, although that verdict is uncontestable if you think of the total number of people who died violent deaths in the 20th century, there were far more people alive in the 20th century than had been alive in all of the previous centuries put together. So that's not really the test. The interesting question is, 
are you at a bigger risk or were you at a bigger risk of death in the 20th century than uh, you were in other centuries? And the clear answer to that is no. Um, I'll come on to the numbers in a minute, but um, I thought that I, I couldn't resist throwing in Newt Gingrich, uh, that uh, famous American philosopher's uh, explanation for uh, an increasingly violent and vicious society, which is 40 years of liberalism. Now, let's try and look at a few statistics on this. Um, in, 19, in 2002, which was the latest year I could get internationally comparable figures, 57 million people died worldwide. And of those, 0.3% died in war and 1% in other forms of violence. Um, one and a half people, uh, percent uh, committed suicide, or at least were recorded as having committed suicide. 2.1% died in road accidents. Now, you might say, well, a lot of the world is relatively peaceful, but Africa is dangerous. Even in Africa, only 2.1% of the population died a violent death. And that compared with nearly 20% who died of AIDS and over 10% who died of malaria is still a small number. If you add it up for the 20th century as a whole, you come to slightly under 4% of all deaths that were caused by violence. Now, that's a lot of deaths, and I don't want to minimize them, but if you compare that with hunter-gatherer societies, where the evidence is controversial and difficult, but where, by the best current estimates, around 14% of all deaths were due to violence, you see that the risk of dying a violent death is now less than a tenth of what it was for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. And that is in spite of the fact that precisely because it was so dangerous, our hunter-gatherer ancestors avoided strangers uh, if they possibly could, whereas we mix with strangers in their hundreds of thousands, in their millions, and we don't think twice about it. And I can go uh, into a restaurant and order a meal from a complete stranger, uh, which is an activity that would have been suicidal for one of my hunter-gatherer ancestors. Okay, here I don't have time for this, but this is a, a graph we can come back to with uh, a number of pieces of evidence from both ethnographic sources and archaeological sources on the comparison between um, present-day violence and uh, violence in, in past centuries. Now, what do we know about how it happened? Um, if we look at the actual statistics, we can see that in historical times for which we can record reasonably reliable homicide rates, the violent levels have declined relatively gradually and continuously since the Middle Ages. That's to say, you know, no sudden things that have happened that explain it. So here, for example, is uh, a set of a, a diagram recording a set of points uh, based on English village studies showing homicide rates in individual villages. So each dot or, or triangle is a, a village and its homicide rate. It's a logarithmic scale, so perhaps the smoothness of the decline is slightly misleading, but what you see is that it's continuous. There isn't a single thing that did it, a single event or a single time. England wasn't that unusual in world terms. These are comparable figures for continental Europe. Now, there were big differences. That blue line at the top is Italy, so it wasn't just Shakespeare's imagination. Italy genuinely was a great source of, uh, of play plots because it was a more violent society, but even in Italy, violence rates came down gradually over the Middle Ages. So the question is, if they kept coming down continuously, it wasn't one thing that they did, what did do it? Well, I suppose it's fair to say that the sort of consensus view, uh, so widely shared that I think many writers believe it even though they don't quite know, they don't quite express it this way, is a view that's probably best expressed by the uh, German sociologist Norbert Elias, uh, in a book which was translated in English as The Civilizing Process. And what he said essentially was that there were two things that happened. Over the period since the early Middle Ages in particular, he wasn't very interested in prehistory, there was a growing influence of certain kinds of civilizing institutions on the incentives for individual behavior. So things like the law courts, armies, firms, and businesses all of which acted to make it more sensible for people to resolve disputes by formal means rather than by resorting to per interpersonal violence. Secondly, he said, there was an extension of ideals of individual behavior, things like self-control, manners, prudence, and so on, which began as the property of a very narrow class of society, essentially the commercial classes, and gradually spread wider and wider, partly through example, partly, um, partly through teaching. And as a result, in the determination of human behavior, honor gradually was edged out by prudence, 
Uh, favoring kin was edged out by ideals of impartiality. Emotion was replaced by reason. Revenge, recourse to revenge, was replaced by recourse to justice and so forth. And there's also a, sp a splendid book by the Israeli political scientist Azar Gat called War in Human Civilization, which in a sense uh, endorses that view and adds the very large benefits from peace in a post-Malthusian world where when you become a bit more prosperous, population growth doesn't dissipate all those benefits of prosperity, so you really have some benefits of peace to defend from a possible recourse to violence. And what I want to suggest is that this view, tempting and broadly convincing as it is, though it's not wrong, is seriously incomplete. And I want to describe briefly an alternative view which has been taking shape in recent years from essentially behavioral economics and neuroscience and related uh, subjects. And this view says, essentially, if you want it in a sentence, is that violence has been edged out as a resort of an option of first resort, not because reason has replaced emotion in the determination of human interpersonal relations, but because it's harnessed emotion. And in particular, there's a lot of evidence, which is laid out in detail in the book, but I don't have time to go into today, from experimental psychology and neurophysiology, suggesting that emotion plays an important role in social cooperation. It's not just that we cooperate because we reason that it's the intelligent thing to do. It's also because our emotions have evolved to make it possible for us. And that was vital to our ancestors' survival. Um, this view also suggests that many of the skills that promote cooperation are adapted modules of our brain. They're not just the neocortex, so to speak, reasoning what it's a sensible thing to do. It's also all of the um, affective parts of our brain, the emotional parts of our brain that are leading us to cooperate. And the result is that, like chimpanzees and other forms of social, violent, uh, social primates, we can be very violent when it pays us to be violent, but we're actually surprisingly peaceful when it pays us to be peaceful. We're good calculators, but we're good calculators because we've uh, managed to evolve both a psychology and a set of institutions, which means that it doesn't pay us to be violent as much as it paid our ancestors. Um, in particular, we know that cooperation requires the ability not just to calculate what's in our interest to do, so f to, you know, to detect cheaters and free riders, to work out that certain people can't be trusted, but also it requires us to be able to commit to others, to have the capacity of empathy, the capacity of, of uh, social generosity to do what we've promised to do, even at some personal cost. And if we didn't have that, and that capacity which is anchored as much in our limbic system as it is in our, our neocortex, um, then we wouldn't be able to cooperate at all. Now, how did it happen? Well, um, if we had brains that really could work out at every possible juncture what exactly it was in our best interest to do, they'd be the size of football stadiums and they wouldn't fit uh, on, uh, our heads wouldn't fit on our necks. Um, Instead, what's happened is that natural selection has economized on the kind of capacities we need to be able to cooperate because brain tissue is very expensive, both to make and to run. And so our ancestors had to encode the capacities we had to cooperate in parts of our brain that could be run relatively economically, either as cognitive shortcuts, things that help us to, for example, look at somebody's face and decide very quickly by seeing where the position of their eyes is, you know, what their interests are in an economic exchange, or in, their em in our emotions, in the things that make us just want to cooperate with people who've been cooperative to us, those shortcuts have essentially been chosen by natural selection because they were very effective ways at cooperating in the circumstances in which we evolved. But, as I reminded you earlier, the circumstances in which we evolved are very different from the circumstances we face today. Okay, so what is that quick historical tour tell us about the consequences for today. Well, today we live in networks of trust that span the whole globe, but we're navigating those with the talents that, as I've said, natural selection uh, chose for us in uh, our Stone Age brains. And they leave us very wide open to certain kinds of risk, particularly, as I suggested, when our institutions are working well. And I want to take the last five minutes, if Matthew's going to let me have those, um, to show how we misjudged the lessons of the financial crisis of the 1930s in a way that left us wide open to the uh, dangers of the financial crisis of the last couple of years. And sadly, uh, if you want a sort of 
foretaste of the future, we're going to learn a lot about the financial crisis of the last couple of years, and it's going to leave us wide open to the next crisis, which is not going to have the same characteristics as this one. So, what did we mislearn from the 1930s? Well, I think, uh, and this is what I describe in detail in the, in the chapter in the book that talks about the recent crisis. The first thing that people believed about the, the 1930s was that the main cause of bank failures was panic. So, you've probably all seen those, those um, uh, newspaper photographs of people lining up outside banks in the 1930s. Several thousand banks failed in the period between 1929 and, and 1932, and you know every day there were uh, stories of banks failing and people lining up on the on the sidewalks and uh, not being able to get their money. And from that came, with no less an authority uh, than that of uh, Milton Friedman and Anna, Anna Schwartz, the view that essentially most banks would be okay if only you could avoid panic. We now know that's mistaken, and um, in the 1930s, as today, we know pretty clearly that most banks actually failed through incompetence or bad management. Panic was usually the result of impending bank failure, not bank failure being the result of panic. The second thing that we fallaciously concluded about the 1930s crisis was that the people who are most prone to panic are the small investors, the households and the people who don't know very much about it. That probably was true in the 1930s. It was emphatically not true recently. And uh, Lehman is the word you should say whenever anybody tells you that it's the small investors who panic. When Lehman Brothers went under, there was a, a massive panic of the professional investors. Now, that of course starts to make a lot more sense if you realize what's wrong with the first conclusion. Because if the only cause of bank failure is panic, then panic is likely to be ill-founded, and it's people who know less about the banking system who are going to be doing the panicking. If, on the other hand, bank failure is likely to be caused by things that genuinely are wrong with the system, then it's the people who know more about it who are most <laughs> likely to take flight. And um, this diagram from a, a, an excellent paper by Gary Gorton, who was the person who uh, gave us that excellent analogy with... Um, electricity grids, shows, in some sense, the panic in action. This is, uh, has the rebarbative title of average repo haircut on structured debt. Um, I promise you that there's not any jargon in the book, but I couldn't resist that. I thought it was such a, a, a ghastly phrase. But it, nevertheless, what it shows you is actually, this is a bank run in action. It's not people lining up on the sword sidewalk in Manhattan, but this is essentially the amount of discount you have to take if you're a large company looking to park money overnight in a uh, market where you hope to be able to get it back very quickly. And these so-called repo markets, as the book describes, were doing for large companies what ordinary bank deposits do for you and me. Um, they were allowing uh, treasurers of uh, large companies to be able to say, okay, well, I've got my money on deposit. I don't have to ask questions about it. It's safe. And indeed, it was safe. For a very long time, the discount you were getting was zero. Everybody was saying, these markets aren't going to fail. But the market seized up, and uh, by the beginning of 2009, um, you were having to discount the assets that you used as collateral by nearly 50%. Okay? This is a bank run in action, but it's just not a bank run by ordinary uh, small-scale uh, investors. So the third conclusion that was drawn from this was the erroneous conclusion that what a banking system really needs is to have its confidence sustained. Okay, and um, that's the overriding thing, and then all of the rest is detail. Well, that view has led us to one bubble after another, and as the chapter on the financial crisis describes, um, you know, the sense that uh, when the dot-com bubble burst at the end of the 1990s, we were in for the most terrible collapse until, hooray, prices went up uh, in the housing market instead, and we could all start to make each other feel richer by selling each other overpriced houses. Um, I describe in that chapter the analogy with uh, an intriguing recent finding in neuroscience called why is it impossible to tickle yourself and um, this is a for neuroscientists in the audience this is a, an excellent piece of research which shows that the reason why you can't tickle yourself is that your brain anticipates the fact that you're trying to tickle yourself and it the cerebellum uh, says no 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 it's not really an unexpected uh, piece of uh, skin uh, contact um, it's not really ticklish um, but you can tickle yourself if you set up a machine that tickles you so that your cerebellum isn't able to work it out. And 
uh, I suggest in the, in the chapter on the financial crisis that essentially we did something rather similar when we agreed to make ourselves feel richer by buying overpriced houses. Because if I had sold Philip Fracas a, 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 an overpriced house and he'd sold his to me um, for, say, double the current market price, we would both have tried to feel better about it, but I think we would both be intelligent enough to realize that this was an accounting swindle. But if the entire population sells overpriced houses to each other, it's like trying to tickle yourself with a machine. The cerebellum doesn't get it, and it's genuinely ticklish, and you feel genuinely wealthier as a result. Okay, I'll, I've given you enough foretaste, I think, of, of that. Let me um, draw to a close with the last slide, which says, okay, why do we engage in this kind of collective delusion? And the important point I want to, to suggest, this is, this is really serious, this, this is not joking, that um, it's not enough to say we're greedy, we're short-sighted. The problem is that the brains are at our most vulnerable precisely when they're doing what they're best at. Okay? And it's because we're so good at creating very effective financial systems that it's when they don't work we're most caught off our guard. And something else that we do very well, and we do particularly well if you compare it with other social primates, is that we're very good at strategic reasoning of the nth degree. If you look at, for example, how chimpanzees interact, they're, they're pretty good at anticipating each other's behavior and movements, but they're not very good at the he thinks that I think that I think that he thinks and so on. And we're good at that, but we're not half as good as we like to think we are. We can do it up to about three, but when you have a population of people, each of them congratulating themselves that they've been able to buy a house which they'll be able to sell just before the bubble collapses, then you have people who are good at the fourth or fifth degree of strategic reasoning and are congratulating themselves because they think they're good at the 20th. And that's when our primate psychology becomes uh, at its most d uh, dangerous. So in some sense, the confidence that we can reason strategically, which was a very, very good thing to pay attention to and a very good and adaptive characteristic in hunter-gatherer societies has proved to be a great liability in the modern world. And that's, in some sense, the lesson that I'd like to, you to take from this book. Thank you. Paul, that was great. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up. And uh, we've got about a quarter for an hour before the session ends. But it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I know that, that uh, you aren't a, not a uh, evolutionary uh, biologist or psychologist, but I'm interested in, nevertheless, your account of why it is that these collaborative empathic tendencies are hardwired in human beings? Why is it they developed in, in, the, in the first place? Um, we had a, a talk here from a woman called Sarah Baffer Hardy, who, who talked about her theory is what she called alloparenting, the fact that, that human infants are brought up by people other than their parents, and that this developed a kind of empathic uh, capacity in human beings. Yeah, no, she, I mean, she has a terrific uh, uh, account of that in her, in her book on parenting. And um, I, I would just say that what's true of parenting is true of many other activities that were common to social life in, in a hunter-gatherer community. We're social primates, and one of the characteristics that social primates have is that um, they form coalitions within the overall social group. So paradoxically, the, the psychology of a social primate is that you depend enormously on collaborating with others for all sorts of tasks that go from hunting to gathering to uh, parenting and, and so forth. But at the same time, you are intensely competitive about how you get into the coalitions that are most uh, powerful and most successful. So that uh, a social primate of any kind, and you know, we're, we, we are particularly highly developed in that respect, faces this tension between an evolved ability to cooperate with people and an intense anxiety about um, whether the most powerful people uh, and effective people to cooperate with are going to want to cooperate with us. So we are prepared to, so to speak, you know, make huge sacrifices to do tasks together and stab in the back anybody else who's going to want to replace me as your cooperative partner. Um, and it's that kind of uh, tension in our, in, our, um, uh, in our psychology that is uh, already very pronounced in virtually every, any other species of, of uh, social primate, but is um, particularly developed in our own case. But we couldn't do almost anything that make social primate life possible if we weren't able to um, empathize with others, understand what they were doing, and 
um, commit ourselves to them. I mean, to, to say genuinely, I'm going to do things for you because I like you. And I have ways of signaling that I like you um, credibly. I've been doing some experiments with colleagues in Toulouse, for example, on how smiling signals um, c cooperative tendencies. It's hard to fake a smile. I mean, politicians are very good at it, but... Uh, uh, but not, not our former prime minister. <laughs> no. uh, <thank> you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All prime ministers who've won elections. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it's hard to do, and it's something that we've learned how to do, um, because it's a way of signalling, you know, it's easier for me to smile convincingly to you if I really like you. And if I really like you, I'm more likely to uh, cooperate with you. So I think that, that um, the, the many, many components of our social psychology evolved because it was genuinely adaptive, because we had the, the niche if you like, the ecological niche in which teamwork produced the big gains. Mm. When I was reading the book and, and then uh, at the same time writing the uh, manual lecture, which I'm doing in, in, in June, you can still get tickets, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I kind of came upon as an idea, which hadn't really occurred in quite the same way before, was the ubiquity of competition in modern culture. That not, we, we're used to the idea that capitalism has become more competitive, globalised markets. But of course we now have competition in the public sector. Uh, if you work in a charity, you're competing with other charities to get into newspapers, your brand, you're competing to get government contracts. Young people compete about the number of friends they've got on Facebook. We have the Turner Prize, so even artists compete to win prizes with the X Factor. So competition has become an incredibly kind of powerful Characteristic. And interestingly, the RSA's origins were kind of giving prizes to people using that competitive spirit. Just interested in your reflections on this, the kind of ubiquity of competition in, in society, and whether or not, as I was suggesting to you before the lecture, whether competition makes it harder to ask the big difficult questions, which your analysis suggests we ought to ask slightly more often, which is, does anybody know whether this system actually does work? It, where is all this risk going to end up residing? Right. You know. Is this competition actually leading us to the right kind of uh, right kind of substantive outcomes for society? Okay, I, I honestly don't know the answer to whether there's more competition now than there was. I mean, my school playground, as I recall, was an intensely competitive place. And um, if you read uh, France de Waal, who, who's written an excellent article in the, in the recent RSA journal, if you read his wonderful book Chimpanzee Politics, you see that although, as France himself says, uh, chimpanzees are immensely cooperative and social uh, animals, they can nevertheless scheme and backstab and compete in extraordinarily Machiavellian ways to um, ensure that their team, as it were, gets to the top. Um, so just as good football demands remarkable collaboration, um, it's also intensely competitive between teams. And um, two players on one team who can have a fantastically collaborative way of sending the ball to each other while their teammates can become uh, deadly enemies when one of them switches teams. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that competition has become more ubiquitous. What is certainly true is that it's entered our awareness in a more conscious way, so that um, we now talk about it and we now become more um, we now integrate it in a, a more explicit way into the way we think about how to do public sector management, for example. There used to be a theory that uh, you know, people who work for private sector firms were inherently greedy and competitive, and people who work for the public sector were inherently sort of warm-hearted and generous, and so on. And I think we know that both of those views is, is simplistic, that people can work for... The, effect, the most effective and profitable private sector firms are often those that harness a collaborative culture among the people who work for them, just as uh, in, in, in the public sector, it's not enough to uh, you know, have a warm heart and, and, and a desire to do good for the world. You have to have a very strong sense of you know, where those um, talents are, are best directed. And sometimes you, you, you develop that sense by competing to see whose collaborative talents produce the best, the best results. So what I would say is that I, I'm not sure that the underlying behaviours change. What's changed enormously has been the discourse and the self-awareness. And on the whole, I think self-awareness is a good thing. Even although, as I said, a you know, brain that was completely self-aware would be too big to manage. But I think having more self-awareness about that is a, is a good idea. And then there was the second part of the question, which says, does it, does competition make it more difficult to ask the right questions? I really don't know. I wish I did. Um, I think that any 
uh, it's not obvious to me that the, um, I mean, let's take something like pollution. Um, you might say competitive uh, market economies are very bad at managing pollution, and they are. But um, the social, the economies of the, of the Soviet bloc produced the most dreadful pollution. And you know, it, it, it seemed to me it wasn't having a competitive versus a collaborative model that made the difference as to who could ask the right long-term questions. It was something far more fundamental built into our uh, extreme willingness to look beyond what the world is like in our immediate vicinity. And that's true whether you have a competitive or a, a, a much more collaborative model of economic relations.